of something that was mandated by Congress at the very end of 2012 in the Middle Class Tax Relief Act of 2012. So CMS was uh, designated through this legislation to track information on patient conditions, the therapy services furnished, the patient functional changes over the course of care, and the outcome that was achieved in the course of care. Eventually CMS will use this information to uh, reform payment for outpatient therapy services. Now there's been no timeline associated with that so I can't really give you any other, any other information about how payment might change or when it might change. But I think we, uh, we can all rest assured that it's going to change sometime in the next two or three years. So unlike PQRS, all, all um, practices who bill for outpatient Part B services must submit functional limitation information with their claims. So this includes uh, all the Part A outpatient settings like hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, comprehensive outpatient rehabilitation facilities and rehabilitation agencies, as well as PT, OT, and speech and language pathologists in private practice. So this program actually went into effect on January 1, although CMS designated the first six months of the year as a testing period uh, up through uh, the end of June 2013. Uh, now, we're not aware of any Medicare intermediaries that are currently accepting and processing the functional limitation uh, codes uh, at this point. Um, I think that that'll probably be changing within the next 30 days. But um, it, you can go ahead and practice and submit the codes. You may be getting information back from your clearinghouse or through your uh, billing provider that certain codes are not, are not being accepted yet by Medicare. I wouldn't be too concerned about that. The payers are struggling just as much as the providers are trying to catch up with uh, the significant regulatory change. Now, after uh, the end of June, starting on July 1, 2013, claims submitted without the appropriate G codes and modifiers will be returned unpaid. So you're going to report this new information, these non-payable G codes and the associated modifiers on your claim forms or in your claim format if you're billing electronically uh, with your bills to report the patient's functional limitations. Non-payable G codes and modifiers will be included on the claim form or in the electronic billing format to capture data on the functional limitations and you'll submit at the outset of the therapy episode at a minimum of every 10th visit, so that means by the 10th visit for sure, but you can report before that, and at the discharge or the end of the therapy uh, episode of care. In addition to uh, the current functional status of the patient, you'll also be reporting on a projected goal uh, for uh, the end of treatment. That'll be reported on your first claim for services and at the end of the episode. Modifiers will indicate the extent or the severity of the uh, complexity of the functional limitation. Now these non-payable G-code categories are derived from the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, otherwise known as the ICF. So the term functional limitations is meant to encompass both the terms activity limitation and participation restrictions as defined by the ICF. Now, uh, there is a list of the actual G codes uh, at the link here, and this uh, handout will be available to you on our website um, after the presentation. And um, on that handout, you'll be able to see all the uh, G codes as well as the modifiers. Now, I haven't produced all the G codes in the slides themselves, but when we get to the end of the presentation, I can uh, show you those on another document. Now, the non-payable G codes are broken up into functional categories, and the functional categories are available to uh, all therapists. They are not limited by your license as to what codes you may select. Certainly, the codes kind of break down into those that are seen to be more likely used by PT and OT, and those more likely to be used by speech. Uh, but the, the codes most likely to be used by PTs and OTs are the mobility code set, the changing and maintaining body position code set, the caring, hand, moving, and handling code set, and then the self-care uh, uh, code set. 
Now, um, each, uh, the PTs and OTs and then the speech also have their subsequent and other functional limitation uh, code sets, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. So codes most likely to be used by speech pathologists as well as others who treat swallowing are the swallowing code set, the motor speech code set. There's two code sets for spoken language, comprehension and expressive. Then there's the attention code set, the memory code set, the voice code set, and then the other speech and language pathology uh, code set. So the way that you, sh you should select the primary limitation you're going to report on is you should select the G-code category that most closely relates to the primary functional limitation that you're treating or represents the primary reason for treatment. This is because that it is highly likely that most of your Medicare patients will have more than one functional limitation. So you need to pick the one that's most meaningful to report on. So if more than one functional limitation is present, you must determine which functional limitation is primary by choosing the functional limitation that's most clinically relevant to the successful outcome for the patient, the one that yields the greatest or quickest progress, or the one that is the greatest priority to the patient. In any case, you should pick the predominant limitation that the furnished therapy services are intended to address. You use the other PT and OTG category if one of three circumstances exists. The first one is that the functional limitation is not defined by one of the four specific categories, that the therapy services are not intended to treat a functional limitation, and I'll have more to say about that in a few minutes, uh, or when an overall composite or other score from a functional assessment tool, and that would include like the patient inquiry tool from photo, or APTA optimal is used and it does not clearly represent a single functional limitation defined by one of the four code sets. You would use the other subsequent functional limitation if you have to report on a different functional limitation uh, after the goals of the first functional limitation are met. And again, we'll have more to say about what to do when you have multiple functional limitations affecting the length of episode of treatment in a few minutes. For speech, again, you would use the other G-code set when one of the uh, other eight uh, gnomes uh, defined functional measures are not described by the code. So the speech and language pathologists have their own uh, outcomes measurement tool called gnomes, and they have eight defined functional measures there. If you want to use a measure that's not defined by one of those eight, then you use the other code set. And then, <clears throat> as in the case with PT and OT, you would use the other to report a composite uh, score from a test like the photo patient inquiry tool or some other kind of uh, uh, gross inventory tool uh, uh, to measure your outcomes. Now, if your patient has multiple functional limitations, and I suspect that most of them will, uh, you will do not report on multiple categories at one time. You only are going to report on one primary functional limitation to Medicare at a time for each patient. So when your treatment is going to continue after the primary functional limitation goal is achieved or progress towards that goal is maximized, reporting should be ended on the primary functional limitation on the treatment day that you decide to, to end it. And then on that day you would report the DCG code. We'll, we'll go through a detailed example so you understand how to actually use the codes. Right now I want to focus on uh, the kind of the rules behind the codes. Reporting will be required for the subsequent limitation. So the second limitation you're going to report on will begin on the next visit after submitting, after the visit in which you submitted the DC status code for the primary functional limitation. So in handling the resolutions of functional limitations, your reporting on more than one functional limitation may be required for some patients, but never on the same visit. So you may, over the entire episode of care, you might report on two or three different functional limitations, but it will be reported on in series, not in parallel. So only one at a time. 
Remember that reporting on the primary functional limitation is complete. The patient will begin reporting on subsequent functional limitation using another G-code set on the next visit. <clears throat> now on the listservs where people are asking questions about this, if you, for example, use the mobility functional limitation set and you meet the goal that you established for that, and you want it, but you need to continue to see the patient because there's other functional limitations, it needs to be in another G code set. It can't still be in the mobility code set. It needs to be in the, in the carrying uh, or moving uh, code set or one of the other code sets. It can't be in the same code set that you just finished reporting on. Now, in some cases, such as with wound care, patients may be receiving therapy service where there is no functional limitation. In these cases, the therapist should select the other PTOT primary functional limitation, and then you're going to select the, the severity modifier, CH, for the current status and for the projected goal. So we'll look at the, the uh, actual severity modifiers in a moment. But um, the CH modifier is the one that says that the 0% impairment, and you would report that for both the current and for the goal status. So these are the severity modifiers. So the, the G code set describes the functional area of the patient. The severity modifier describes how impaired they are. So every time you report a G code, you're always going to report a severity modifier. So you can see that there are seven severity modifiers. They all start with the letter C, and then they run through the letters H through N. Before uh, anybody asks, I don't understand why the, those are the ones they pick, but that's what they pick. And you'll see they start with 0% impaired, limited, or restricted, and they go all the way to 100%. And they go up in increments of 20% increases. So, for example, you see one that's uh, at least 20% and less than 40%. So if you had a patient who was, uh, you know, 35% impaired, and your goal was to get them to 20% impaired, you're actually, your severity modifier wouldn't change between the current functional status and the goal status. They would be the same, and that is uh, 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 permitted. So in determining which severity modifier to use, you need to remember the severity modifier reflects the patient's percentage of functional impairment as determined by the clinician furnishing the therapy services for each functional status. So remember, there's three functional statuses. There's the current functional status, the goal functional status, and the discharge functional status. So each mobility code set has three G codes, and each one has a current status, a goal status, and a discharge status. Then to complete these, you add the appropriate severity modifier to uh, report on the amount of impairment they have for that particular functional limitation or for the goal. So when you select the severity modifier, the clinician should use the severity modifier that reflects the score from a functional assessment test or other measurement instrument. So certainly uh, there are calculators out there, many of you have seen them, where you can take a score from a particular test, you can put it into the calculator, and it will it'll calculate a percent of functional limitation for you. Just be advised that the very test that you're using that we're shown to be valid and reliable uh, in the literature are not necessarily that once you apply this mod, this calculator to it, because they weren't tested with the modifier. But CMS is very clear in articulating that the therapist can use other factors to figure out the percentage of uh, disability. And certainly a big portion of that is based on clinical judgment. And or you can use and or you can use multiple tests. You're not limited to using one outcomes measure. You might use one or two or several. So you can use an actual percentage from a tested score, or you can use your clinical judgment to select one. Finally, you would use the CH modifier to reflect a zero percent impairment when the therapy services being furnished are not intended to treat or address a functional limitation. So for example, if your patient is on a maintenance program, then they may have, you may use the CH modifier on that. If they're doing some other, if they have a wound or something that really doesn't affect their function in the four functional areas described by the code set, then you would use the CH modifier to reflect that. 
Now, each therapist needs to document how they made the modifier selection so that the same process can be followed in all follow-up assessments. So Medicare is very interested in you following whatever process you use to decide on what the percentage of functional limitation was, that you repeat that same process each time you're selecting the severity modifier. So how you select the severity modifier has to be documented, even if you use a calculator. Therapists must report the G-codes and modifiers for the current status, the projected goal, and the discharge status on the date of service that they are recorded with the severity determination documentation. So G-codes are sent to Medicare on days where you have billable services to the patient, usually during a patient visit. If there is no patient visit, then you can't submit the codes to Medicare, and that'll become important when we talk about discharging. Okay, uh, Medicare has recommended assessment tools for years. Um, the ones that they recommend in the online Medicare manuals are the post-acute uh, tool called the AMPAC, the patient inquiry tool by photo, and the APTA optimal tool, and then the outcome measures from the GNOME system for speech. So you're not required to use these tools, but they are strongly recommended. Now, you can use other tests and measures, which are designed to report about a specific body part, an area, or a condition. So other examples of those would be the timed up-go test, the bird balance test, and Eddie's test, the DASH. Uh, if you want a fairly exhaustive list of OTMs that you can use, if you're a physical therapist and a member of the APTA, you can go to the Guide to Physical Therapist at APTA.org, go to the Test and Measures chapter, and in the Test and Measures chapter, there's a list of over 200 uh, OTMs. Most of them have links, uh, internet links, out to the article where you can actually go and read about the measure, understand how to apply the measure, and then look at the norms associated with the measure and how to score the measure. So that's a very useful tool, and you can get those there. Various sections of APTA, like the geriatric section, have also published information on their websites about OTMs that are specifically uh, geared towards the patient population represented by that section. So when st statuses and, and severity modifiers are the same. So in cases where the therapist does not expect improvement, such as those individuals receiving maintenance therapy, the reported projected goal status will be the same as the current status. In some cases, the modifier for the current functional status and the projected goal will be the same. So I gave you an example of this earlier. So you may have someone that's 35% uh, uh, has a 35% limitation, and maybe the goal is to get them to 20% limited. So that happens to fall within uh, one severity modifier. So in that case, the projected goal and the current status severity modifiers would be the same. So therapists must report the functional, functional limitation data at the following intervals. So at the beginning of the episode of care, that means on the claim for the data service for the initial therapy service. So that would be the day you'd be doing your initial evaluation and your plan of care. Then you must report at least once every 10 treatments. So this corresponds with the new progress reporting period for 2013. So prior to this year, Medicare progress reports were due uh, every 10th visit or 30 days, whichever came first. Starting January 1, they did away with the 30 days. So now you have to report at least once every 10 treatment visits. Now you can report more often than that, and that would simply restart the reporting period. So you could report on the seventh visit, and then your next one would be due by the 17th visit rather than the 10th visit and the 20th visit. So you must also report whenever you bill an evaluative or reevaluative procedure. You must report at the time of discharge from the therapy episode of care. And that means specifically on the date that the discharge progress report was completed. You also need to report at the time of 
a particular functional limitation has ended in cases where the need for further therapy is necessary. So you may discharge a particular uh, goal and then start reporting on a new functional goal the next visit. So the evaluative procedures for PTs and OTs are pretty simple. It's the PT or OT evaluation or reevaluation. For speech, it's a little bit more complicated because they have a, a, a larger number of procedures that have an evaluative component, and they would need to report whenever they report one of these codes. So here's the timing summary again. And I repeat this a number of times on purpose because this is the, the most critical element, right? So at the outset, you must report the projected goal for the patient as well as the current status. You must report also at the 10th visit the current status of the projected goal. And then at discharge, you report the projected goal and their status at the time of discharge. Now discharge reporting is required except in cases where therapy services are discontinued by the patient prior to the planned discharge visit. So you can't report the non-payable G codes if there's no visit associated with it. So if your patient discharges and it's not at a time you expected, so you were expecting them to come in for more visits, but they decided to discharge themselves or the physician decided to discharge them, there is no discharge visit. So there is no ability to send in a G code for that. But what Medicare said in a prior slide was that you must report of the on the discharge status when you do the discharge progress report, which you still have to provide even though you didn't know the patient was going to be discharged. And there's no change in that, by the way. That's the way it's always been. Remember that a therapist is required to begin a new reporting period when billing for an evaluation or a reevaluation. So a therapist must, must submit information on the current functional status and the projected patient goal with the appropriate modifiers whenever they do evaluation or reevaluation. And remember that a reevaluation would trigger a new progress reporting period and would also likely trigger a new plan of care that would need to be recertified. The main reasons why you do a reevaluation are because you need to change the discharge goals for your patient. And that usually occurs because your patient's progressing more quickly than you anticipated, more slowly than you anticipated, or something else happened with the patient since the last time you see since the last time you saw them, which causes you to have to reproject the their episodes for the or their goals for that episode of care. So once the primary functional limitation is resolved, but you need to continue care to address other functional limitations, the patient reports that the limitation after the primary limitation reporting is concluded, on the visit the goal was achieved or plateaued. So we'll go through some examples and hopefully that'll make things a little clearer. So here's the case in which uh, you evaluate a patient and you decide to use the mobility code set. So you report the mobility uh, current status, which is G8978. So you're going to report that current status and then the appropriate severity modifier and that would reflect how the patient is the first day you see them. What percentage impaired are they? Then you're also at that time going to construct a goal for that mobility status and you're going to pick a modifier that's going to uh, prognosticate, if you will, what functional level they will be at by the time they reach this goal. Now it's important that you remember to include this goal in your goal set on your plan of care. And we'll have more to say about that in a little bit. So then you get to the 10th visit, which is the end of the first reporting period for Medicare. So you're going to do your regular Medicare progress report. Uh, and then you're going to report the patient's current status. So you'll, you'll, again, you'll report G8978, which is the mobility current status code and a new severity modifier. So let's say your patient was 80% um, impaired when you did their uh, initial evaluation. Now you get to the 10th visit and now they're only 60% impaired. Then you would report the appropriate uh, severity modifier to reflect that. 
you'll also re-report the goal status. So the goal status and that modifier that you report on the 10th visit would be the same goal status and modifier you reported on the initial visit, right? Because that goal hasn't been met yet, so that goal is still in play. Then on the 14th visit, you decide the patient's met the goal and you're going to discharge them from therapy. You're going to report the, goal, the same goal status, G8979, with the same severity modifier you reported on the first visit and the 10th visit, right? Because that's the goal you were shooting for. And then you're going to report how close they got to that goal, goal by reporting the discharge status, G8980, plus the severity modifier that reflects the new percentage of uh, functional limitation that they have uh, at the end of the episode of care. So you'll notice you're always reporting at least two G codes every time you report. You're pretty much always reporting the same goal status and modifier. You, re you report the current status on each visit that isn't the discharge goal, that isn't the discharge visit. The severity modifiers on the current status change to reflect how the patient's progressing during their episode of care. And then at discharge, you report the discharge status with the discharge with the severity modifier that reflects the patient's functional ability relative to that reporting category. Now, here is an example of a patient with two functional limitations. So they're going to meet one partway through the episode of care, and then you're going to report on a subsequent one. Now, remember that you could be treating more than one functional limitation on your patient throughout the course of care, but you're only reporting on one, the predominant one, remember? Okay, so you're going to go on the day that you see the patient on the, for the initial evaluation, you establish their plan of care. That starts the first reporting period. You're going to report their uh, current status with the severity modifier that reflects their current degree of disability. And then you're going to report the goal status for the same group and then the modifier that reflects where you think the patient will be once the goal is met. Now we'll say you get to the seventh visit and you've decided you've met the first goal, so you're going to uh, report the goal status that you were going for with the modifier, that's the same modifier you reported on the initial evaluation, and then you're going to report the DC status with the, with the modifier that reflects the new amount of disability as a result of the treatment, and it would be, you know, at or better than the goal status, correct? Now, the patient, you're still not done in treating the patient because the patient's got other problems. So you have them come in for their eighth visit. This would reflect the first reporting period uh, the following the discharge of the initial functional limitation, and you're going to report the new functional limitation you're going to be reporting on on this visit. So you're going to have go to another uh, um, functional code set. You're going to report the current status for that one and then the severity modifier which reflects the percentage of disability uh, when you start uh, reporting on that new functional limitation code set. And then you're going to establish a new goal for that code set. So you're going to report the goal status and then you're going to say that you're going to improve the patient to a lower percentage of disability, and that will be reflected in the um, in the uh, severity modifier you select. Then, by the time you get to the 14th visit, you've decided they met that second goal. So, at that point, you're going to report another. Uh, you're going to report the goal status for the second functional limitation you reported on the eighth visit, with the same modifier you reported on the eighth visit. And then you'll report the discharge status for that new, uh, for that subsequent functional limitation with the severity modifier that reflects the amount of improvement that was made between the 8th visit and the 14th visit. So remember that the therapist who furnishes the treatment must report the functional limitation on the therapy claim, but in addition, they must track and document the G-codes and severity modifiers used in reporting in the medical record as part of the goal setting and tracking process in the medical record. So the way you want to think about this is when you construct your goals for your Medicare plan of care, you want to include all the functional goals for all the functional limitations you're going to be treating. 
because if one gets met during the course of care, then you can just start reporting on one of the other goals you've already established. Otherwise, you have to create new goals, which would force you to do a new plan of care and to get a new certification from the physician. So you can save yourself a little extra paperwork and wear and tear by making sure that you include all your functional limitation goals uh, in your plan of care at the beginning of the episode. So when you report your functional limitation of a patient to Medicare, you're going to submit a G-code with the following components. The date of the therapy visit, the functional limitation G-code, the functional severity modifier. Uh, you will also need to apply the GP, the GO, to the GN, you know, uh, modifiers like you always do on any therapy codes. Um, and then you also will probably need to report at least one cent. I know the elect Medicare electronic claims formats do not take zero dollar amounts uh, in the charge uh, column. You have to include at least one cent there. You can write that off as soon as you submit it so that you don't you know, artificially inflate your AR. But um, you'll want to be sure that you include the severity modifier, the GP, GO, GN, and then the uh, one cent charge. You do not have to report the KX modifier on your non-payable G codes. So the G code requirements for each reporting period can be summarized this way. The therapist is always going to report two G codes whenever they report, one representing either the current or the discharge functional status. So you'd be reporting the current functional status at every visit where you have to report to the discharge when you would report the discharge function status. The other code you're going to report is the G code for that functional code set. And the severity modifier that goes with that G code will remain unchanged throughout the reporting process because it is a goal. Now there's two exceptions to having to report two codes. The first one is if your practice is submitting claims from more than one provider type on the same day. So if you have someone seeing PT and OT, or OT and speech, or PT and speech on the same day, then you would have, and it's a reporting day for both services, then you could re be reporting four uh, functional limitation G codes in one visit. But that's because there's multiple providers uh, involved. The other exception is in a one-time therapy visit. So if in the case that you have an evaluation or an evaluation and treatment with no further visits planned for the patient, the therapist is going to report all three G codes in the appropriate code set. So you would report the current status, the goal status, and the discharge status all on the date of the initial evaluation and treatment. And you would obviously also report the corresponding severity modifiers uh, for that. They could all be the same. They could be a little different. Uh, I don't think that's what's really essential. The essential thing is for you to remember that you need to report three in the case of a one-time therapy visit. Now, the good news is that for Medicare Advantage plans, you do not have to submit the functional limitation reporting for the Medicare Advantage plans. However, if Medicare is a secondary payer, you do need to submit the functional limitation data with the secondary claim to Medicare. Now, um, this is probably the part we know the least about. We're not sure what the uh, primary payers, who are generally commercial insurance payers, are going to do with functional limitation codes. They will probably just ignore them. Uh, but when you send the claims in to Medicare for secondary payment, you'll want to submit your functional limitation G codes and severity modifiers at that time. So uh, from a summary, perspective. At the start of care, on the date of the initial evaluation and the day that you produce your plan of care, you're going to submit two G codes with modifiers. The current status with the uh, severity modifier and then the goal status with the goal severity modifier. You're going to do uh, the, the progress report at least every 10 visits. You're going to report two G codes again at that time the current status with the updated severity modifier, which will probably be different than the current status was 
uh, on the initial evaluation. And then the goal status uh, G code with the, G, with the goal uh, severity modifier that you established on the first visit. So the goal status and the severity modifier will be the same for those two reporting uh, visits. At discharge, you'll report two G codes again with modifiers. This time you submit the goal status because you're at discharge. You're going to submit the goal status with the severity modifier. Again, that's the same severity modifier you reported with the goal the previous two times. And then you're going to report the status of discharge by reporting the, the DC status along with the updated severity modifier that reflects the current state of patient function. Now, if your patient has met the first goal and you continue to treat them at this point, then you would um, You would report a new uh, functional limitation goal at the next visit so that you would be uh, reporting on a current status on a new functional limitation code set with a new current status severity modifier. And you'd be establishing a new goal status with a new uh, uh, severity modifier for that new goal. And you would continue to do that until you discharge the patient. Then you would do a discharge progress report, report the goal status with the severity modifier, and the uh, DC status with the severity modifier. We'll take questions in a few minutes. But one way that BMS can help you is we provide this type of training for our clients at no cost uh, in, at, at a little uh, higher uh, degree of uh, a depth of training than we're doing in the, our marketing webinars. And it's important for you to know that we take a consultative approach with you to help you understand financially whether we can really help you to take you on as a billing client. We look at uh, six months worth of data, we look at your EOBs, we do a coding profile, and we really look at that to benchmark you to see where you are uh, for your payment and your aging performance in your region of the country. Um, our RevFlow technology helps ensure your reporting accuracy and your workflow efficiency, and we do provide lots of training to our clients um, as part of what we do. If you'd like to schedule a free demo to see our software, both our billing and reporting software, which accompanies our revenue cycle management services, we also have our own EMR and scheduler as part of that service. Uh, you can see all of those things by scheduling a demo. Uh, if you have, uh, if you'd like to contact us about helping you look at your practice and do uh, the practice payment scorecard so you can see how you compare regionally, you can contact us at getstartednow at bmsemail.com or you can call 877-774-6625. Now, uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions and answers. Uh, hopefully, I'll have answers for all of your questions. Uh, Leah, I'm going to turn it back over to you to uh, moderate the question and answer session. Great. If you have question and answers, you will be able to use the raise your hand feature by entering the audio pin on your phone line. If you are listening on your computer and have a microphone, please use that feature and I will unmute you. You will be able to type your questions also using the question box feature in the lower, hand, lower right hand corner of your screen. John, I will go ahead and read the first question from Heather Hackworth. Okay. Her question is, does this reporting have to be done by a PT or can a PTA complete the visit and corresponding reporting? Well, um, so this is a fine point to be sure, but remember that uh, determining whether a patient, what the patient's current functional status is, or whether they've achieved their goal is the function of a therapist, not of an assistant. So that is clinical judgment and assessment that is in the realm of the physical therapist or the occupational therapist or the speech and language pathologist. 
So certainly the assistant can report, you know, if they're doing the data entry, but it's the role of the therapist to actually make the determination about what the current functional status is, whether they've met the goal, and uh, what the, the, uh, the severity of the limitation is uh, at the current status or at discharge. Great. Our next question comes from Debbie Griffin. If you report at the time of the progress note is due, 10th visit, and then in two visits the recertification is due, is your understanding that the G code would then again need to be reported? Um, you're not necessarily required to report the G code at the time you update the plan of care unless you do an evaluation as part, a reevaluation as part of that. So, um, you know, typically um, you would not be um, uh, having to do it that way. So, uh, you can do your progress report, report at that time. You don't need to report any other codes when you update the plan of care if you're not going to restart the reporting period by doing a reevaluation. Great. Question from Paul Marino. Relative to patient example two on consecutive FLs, what if they unexpectedly show up with a complete recovery on the primary functional limitation? Can you begin working toward the new functional limitation even though you have to use this visit to DC the initial FL? Oh yeah, the, the functional limitation reporting doesn't control what you work on. It only controls when you report. So if your patient showed up and they were spontaneously better, you would just use that visit to report that the functional limitation was goal was met. You can start working on the, uh, you know, assuming you can be working on multiple functional limitations at one time. Medicare is not saying you can only work on one functional limitation at a time. They're saying you can only report on one at a time. So and then at the visit after that would be the first time you would report on the new functional limitation that would that you'd be reporting on um, after the first one was met. So I can't emphasize that strongly enough. Medicare is not telling you you can only work on one functional limitation at a time, but telling you you can only report on one at a time. So you would just discharge that one on the day that they show up. The day they show up, if the limitation is no longer there, you'd report that the goal was met or exceeded, and then you would go ahead and do their treatment that day. And then on the next visit would be the first reporting uh, day on the subsequent functional limitation. Our next question comes from Cheryl Winner. If we are currently seeing a patient now and are not reporting, when we start in July, do we then just begin to report from where the patient are now? Okay, so that's a very good question and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Medicare has not given any specific guidance about what to do with patients that are in process on July 1. Um, I was asked that question this morning and I think the way I would answer it today is that it, ideally I think we should all make it a goal to be doing our reporting by June 1. So all your new patients that come in June you could go ahead and report your initial goal sets on and all those things and that way you're, they're already in process when you uh, hit July 1. But we'll have to watch and see if Medicare gives any specific guidance about how to report on patients who are partway through their episodes of care come July 1. Our next question comes from Donna Chisholm. What happens if a patient discharges themselves without your knowledge and we have already sent the claim in for that date? Well, you can't send a claim in for a visit that wasn't completed. So I would assume that what you mean by your question is if you see a patient and before they come in for the next visit, they discharge themselves, then you would do what you do today. You would do your discharge progress report. It doesn't need to be associated with a visit, but you can't really report the discharge uh, functional status because there is no visit associated with the discharge to report against. Our next question comes from Doreen Holmes. How are the G codes placed on the CMS 1500 along with the charge codes for the day of service? 
uh, you would treat the non-payable G codes the same way you treat your CPT codes. They get their own line on the claim form. You have to use the appropriate remember G modifier and then you would use the functional status uh, modifier along with that. Okay, I have a hand raised from Debbie Griffin. I'm not sure if we answered your question before, but I will unmute your phone and you can answer, ask your question. It was answered, thank you. Okay, My thank you. My question was answered, thank you. Thanks, Debbie. If there are any other questions, Please feel free to type them or raise your hand. Okay, that about sums up our, our question and answer segment. If you have any questions that come to mind after this call, please feel free to email me at landerson at bmsemail.com and I will have John answer them accordingly. Thank you for joining BMS Practice Solutions and our webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to follow up with us. Our next webinar will take place on May 22nd, Wednesday, and we will be doing some training on PQRS codes. Please look out in email and on our website for further information. Thank you.